I was in my senior year at Naples High School in 1975 when a group of my surfing buddies and I decided to make the roughly 240 mile trip from the Gulf Coast to Cocoa Beach on the East Coast for the Easter spring break. It was my first time going to Cocoa Beach. I had heard all kinds of stories of super good waves, lots of surf shops, and hot bikinis on the beach, all of which were non-existent in Naples. I was super excited for this trip. Of course, none of us had a car back then, so with 10 guys in our group, we decided to take the next best thing, the Trailways Bus. Naples had a bus station downtown, so eight of us loaded up on the bus with our surfboards and rode the bus all night to the bus station in Coco. The other two guys decided to hitchhike to Cocoa Beach with their surfboards. Good luck with that. We arrived in Coco about four in the morning, got our stuff off the bus, and then had to find a way to get from Coco to Coco Beach, which was about another 20 miles away. I know I wasn't going to hitchhike, so four of us pulled our money together and hailed a taxi, which happened to be parked right there. The driver was cool and agreed to take four of us and our boards beachside. He called for a second taxi for the other four guys, and we were off again. We had made reservations at the iconic Satellite Motel that was right on the beach and walking distance to the Canaveral Pier. It was still dark when the taxi driver dropped us off at the hotel, and the check-in time wasn't until noon or something like that. So we gathered all our stuff and sat in a little clearing in the palmetto brush in the empty lot next to the hotel. Once it got daylight, we moved on down to the beach and a few of us paddled out for our first surf trip. I didn't have a camera back then, so these Super 8 movies my friend Ron took are the only visual record of our trip. Coming from a very small town that didn't support surfing at all, this trip was an epic adventure. By the way, the two guys at Hitchhike made it just in time to paddle out with us. They had a pretty good story to tell, but my story about how I was on my way to getting lucky in the Satellite Hotel's Pillow Talk Lounge before getting thrown out for being underage has them beat. Only a few of our group made the walk to the Canaveral Pier where the JCs were putting on the annual Easter Surfing Festival, and unfortunately I wasn't one of them. They told stories of a beach packed with bikinis while pro surfers took to the waves, and I knew that I would have to return next year and spend all my time at that contest. Later that summer, I got my first 35mm film camera and started taking surfing pictures. When I returned to Cocoa Beach for the Easter Surfing Festival, I thought it would be a great opportunity to get some pictures of the pro surfing that I could send to the magazines. Unfortunately, the surf never seemed to cooperate with the contest, and there is usually very little for the pros to surf on. I would end up passing the time taking pictures of people on the beach.
surprisingly, I got a few of my beach pictures published in the surfing magazines, which was kind of a big deal back then. And by 1980, I had girls left and right asking me to do pictures of them so they could be in the magazines. I was at the beach one day taking surfing pictures at Spanish House, and this girl came walking towards me in this blue bikini I recognized from this cover of Cosmopolitan magazine worn by Christy Brinkley. It was a new style by designer Norma Kamali, and what made it unusual was the way the straps could be used to pull up the bottoms as high as the user wanted, making it totally adjustable. It was my first time seeing one in the wild, and the sight of Jackie walking towards me on the beach that day took my breath away. She stepped towards the water and I snapped this shot. I had to get one of her from the front, so when she turned to walk towards me again, I took this shot just as a wave splashed up her side. In my eyes, it was perfect. Jackie saw me take her picture and walked right up to me and in a thick southern drawl asked me what kind of camera is that? Turned out she had just bought her own 35 millimeter camera to take some surfing pictures and we ended up talking photography for a while. She really liked my 500 millimeter lens and I let her try to take a picture with it but it was hard for her to hold steady. Jackie was from Jacksonville Beach and I saw her the following year at the Easter Surfing Festival. I took these pictures of her in this leopard one piece as she walked around the contest. I don't know why I never set up a photo shoot with her, but it probably had something to do with time and the distance between us. I had bought that Super 8 movie camera from Ron that he used to document our first trip and got some film of Jackie and her friend on the beach. I met them later for a drink at Brassy's and told them I was going to drive out to Southern California for the summer and Jackie said she wanted to go. Turned out the alcohol was doing all the talking. I did see her at the 1981 Rolling Stones concert in Orlando at the Citrus Bowl and she was there with another girl to give out some big prize on the stage that the WDIZ radio station was giving away. They both looked smoking hot in their tiny bikinis. Later, she saw me by the concession stand and came running over, still in her bikini and heels, and gave me a big hug. So I'm standing there talking to her and somebody shows up with a camera and asks to take our picture. Jackie and the other girl get on each side with their arms around me and they take the shot. I never got to see the picture but judging by everyone's expression around us, it was pretty special. I don't have very many pictures of me, but that one would be my all-time favorite for a variety of reasons, if you know what I mean, and I think you do. Perhaps the internet will find it for me. Back to the Easter Surfing Festival and all the action going on below me, I certainly had plenty to keep me busy. Usually there are a few standouts, and Patty was one of them for sure. She was walking around in some very nice bikinis, and I knew right away she had what it takes to be a swimwear model. I got to know her, and it turned out she surfed too, so we went to Second Light a few times to catch some waves. I'd surf for a while and then come in to take pictures. I hadn't talked to her about modeling yet, and she gave no hints that she wanted to model, so I tried to get her interested by having her stop for a few pictures after surfing when she was all wet. And sometimes I'd get her to pose for a few pictures before she paddled out. 
We got one of those pictures published in a surfing magazine, and I think that was a boost to her confidence. She was ready to take modeling seriously. After that, we did several photo shoots using two or three rolls of film at a time. Keep in mind, I was still learning how to photograph models, and it's 1980, so my camera is all manual settings, so dealing with extreme lighting conditions was very challenging. Patty, on the other hand, was doing a fantastic job following my directions, and her body was built for bikinis on the beach. collaboration paid off when I got this two-page spread in Wave Rider magazine, which included two pictures of Patty in the lower left and upper right corners. I also took the picture of Dawn with the long hair, but I'll save her story for another time. The magazine exposure got Patty a job modeling for Blue Man Bikinis at the Surf and Skate Expo. That was the hot bikini line at the time, and I had photographed Patty in a few of the ones she had, like this yellow bikini that she filled out perfectly. Once a good model gets noticed, 
Her career can really take off fast, and that's what happened to Patty. She got a billboard for Ron John's surf shop, and the Blue Man modeling job at the expo caught the attention of another exhibitor, and soon after she was on the cover of Water Ski Magazine and modeling inside for their swimsuit issue. Patty loved that white bikini she wore on the cover, which they let her keep, and she just had to show me, so she wore it next time we went to the beach to play some frisbee. And of course, I had to break out the Super 8 camera. There was another girl on the beach that had caught my attention, for obvious reasons, and as luck would have it, she turned out to be one of Patty's best friends. Her name was Kelly, and she also surfed, so we would all pile in the car and drive down to Spanish House. She had no desire to model, but knew I needed models to work with to gain experience. So she graciously stepped up and let me shoot two rolls of her at the beach one afternoon.
I think the pictures turned out great and wish Kelly had more interest, but I can't really do much when the desire isn't there. Modeling takes passion to be really good, and that's what Patty had. Of course the Easter Surfing Festival had more going on than just bikinis on the beach. They had a bikini contest too. <laughs> Kidding aside, there were some cool exhibitions like the one the Ocean Avenue skate team put on in the pier parking lot featuring Jim McCall, considered to be one of the world's best at that time. When the waves were contestable, there was plenty of action out in the water and I was willing to burn up a 5 minute reel of Super 8 film to capture it. The whole weekend was super fun and why I returned almost every year since.
on to 1986, which was the first year I got to use a VHS video camera. It was so much better because I didn't have to worry about getting the correct exposure like I did with the Super 8 film, and I could record an hour and a half on one VHS tape compared to five minutes on one Super 8 film reel that I had to pay to get developed. Doing the math, a 90-minute VHS tape cost $10.00 and you could record over the bad parts. 90 minutes of developed Super 8 film cost about $200. Once I got my hands on a VHS camcorder, I went wild. <laughs> See, the 1986 Easter Surfing Festival is blessed with waves, and the contest was stacked with some of the best surfers at that time. Most notably was a then 14-year-old Kelly Slater that was just beginning his journey of becoming an 11-time world surfing champion, and the greatest surfer of all time. But first, he would have to compete and win against top surfers like Pat Mulhern, Richie Rudolph, and John Holman. Unfortunately, we can't hear the announcer on the mic doing play-by-play -play from my position on the pier, so I set these first few surfing heats of the day to music. Here's a few of the best surfers in 1986, including one that would become the best ever. <laughs>
hanging out on the pier is a pretty good spot to catch most of the action. The best place to stand for getting some surfing video is out past the restaurant towards the end. The best place to stand to people watch is beachside and the action is non-stop. I have to keep my head on a swivel because there is always a steady stream of people walking on the pier right behind me and I don't want to miss any opportunities. Like the time Danielle walked by and showed me just how much she loves the camera. She was another girl I met at the beach and talked into doing a photo shoot. Like Kelly, she really didn't have an interest in modeling or maybe she didn't have the confidence. Back then, becoming a model or actress seemed to be a dream too far out of reach for a lot of these girls, so they wouldn't take it seriously or believe in themselves. I thought Danielle had a nice figure that would be great for bikini modeling. I talked to her into doing some pictures, so she came over to my house one day and we spent the afternoon shooting a few rolls of film at the beach. Then we went back to my house and continued shooting on my back deck an outdoor shower. Looking at our results, I thought Danielle had a lot of potential. Keep in mind, this is what we considered a test shoot just to see how it would go. She had no makeup on and no hairstylist. 
both of which would have helped take her appearance to the next level. She was very easy to work with and followed my directions which helps immensely when getting in the right position for the natural lighting and when getting in the right pose. I really would have liked to get Danielle back for another photo shoot with hair and makeup assistance along with some new bikinis and outfits, but her desire wasn't there and we were one and done. That's okay because I knew it was going to take several different models to help me build a solid photographer's portfolio and Danielle would be one of several welcome additions. That's why I was staying on the pier at the 1986 Easter Surfing Festival, searching through the crowd looking for my next discovery that would help elevate my career.
One of the girls that really caught my eye was Cheryl. I thought she could definitely be a bikini model. Fashion models back then had to be at least 5 feet 10 inches tall no matter how good they looked. That restriction has since been relaxed, but back then it was a deal breaker for most girls with fashion modeling aspirations. That's why bikini modeling was much more attainable for those that didn't meet the strict height requirements to be in fashion. While we had mutual friends, and I knew Cheryl was a super nice person, I never got the opportunity to set up a photo shoot with her. I'd seen her several times at the beach, and she always had the best bikinis, and I knew they would look great in pictures. She also had the desire and drive I'd been talking about, because I'd seen her compete in at least two bikini contests. It takes a lot to get up on stage in a tiny bikini in front of a lot of people, and she found a way.
going to file Cheryl under shoulda, woulda, coulda, but didn't, and I'm an idiot. Let's get back to the rest of the surfing competition. I don't know who won, and I can't tell from the video if this was the finals, but I'm guessing it's pretty close. I tried looking online to see if there was any info or an entry list to no avail. Here's some of the action late in the contest with a mashup of different divisions and what looks like Kelly Slater and Richie Rudolph still in it and battling for the win. <laughs>
After searching some more on the Google, I was able to find some information on the 22nd annual Easter Surfing Festival held in 1986 at the Canaveral Pier. Turns out it came down to Todd Holland surfing against Kelly Slater in the Pro Finals. It was a very close heat that had everyone on the beach guessing, but in the end the judges declared Kelly Slater is the winner. At that time, Kelly was maintaining his amateur status, so he was unable to collect the $500 check for first place. Todd Holland finished second, but he was also declaring amateur status, so a surf-off between equal third-place finishers Richie Rudolph and Billy Austin was held to determine who would get the money, and in the end... Billy Austin from Daytona Beach won the prize money allocated for first place. Looking back, I wish I would have done a better job of recording the competition, as it can now be deemed historical in value. It's just, back then it was hard to get excited about all that riding in the whitewater, especially when the next Mrs. Photographer could be right there roaming the beach in a bikini. At any rate, the whole event is one big party that I looked forward to every year. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this story from One Photographer's Life.